Thank you so much, Marcy, for a wonderful beginning. And I also want to echo my thank you for organizing this fantastic panel. And I, I also want to repeat what she said at the beginning, especially when we're talking about our neighbor to the south. It really, when it comes to questions of health and public health, it's more about cooperation and not about building walls. And I think Mexico, when we talk about the flu pandemic of 1918, Mexico had one of the highest de death rates in all of Latin America. And this is in part because it comes one year after a decade of revolution in Mexico. But to understand that, we need to step back a little bit to the historical context before we speak about what, the, um, what influenza meant for Mexico in the 1918. So Mexico gains its independence about a century earlier from Spain in 1921, but it will spend the entire 19th century invaded by Spain, by France, by Britain, and in 1848 by the United States, where Mexico loses 52% of its territory to the United States. What this meant was that this was a country that was constantly at war. And when you're constantly at war, this means that you have little funds, to create infrastructure that are, that are needed, something as simple as sidewalks or roads, but especially hospitals. And most of those hospitals would be filled with soldiers from this continuous, just this uh, cycle of invasions. Mexico will have a period of, of peace in the late 19th century when it will be governed by a dictator. In 1910, a revolution to oust this dictator happens. And this revolution will be bloody, and it will be protracted, and it will entail all of Mexico. One million Mexicans will die during this decade. A million and a half will flee as refugees into the United States. This is happening. So this, to give you a sense of this was really a society in flux. And it was a society in which crops were not being planted or harvested. Industries had shut down or were broken down. The, uh, trains that crisscrossed the nation and had been the pride of the dictatorship had been shut down or had um, been, in many instances, destroyed. So Mexico, in 1917, creates a new constitution as a way of saying, we finally have found peace. And in this constitution, Article 5 promises that there will be health care for all, well ahead of most countries. An amazing promise, but what's written on paper doesn't always translate to reality. And it will take decades for Mexico to complete that constitutional promise. I mention this because it is less than a year after that constitution is signed and made public that influenza arrives in Mexico's coast. So this is a country that, again, is torn, has been torn apart by waves of war, that has lost a great part of its population, its young population. And how does influenza arrive to Mexico? It's a two-pronged approach. It arrives via the border from the United States into Mexico, into the northern states. But it also arrives from Cuba, from a ship that had been sailing from Europe to Cuba, and is docked outside one of the leading ports in the south of Mexico, Veracruz. So this Alfonso VIII ship is docked, and because of the lack of communication, the sanitary inspector in the port allows people to descend, except those who had visible signs of being sick. And those people then fan out across Mexico using the railroads. So the railroads are the way in which influenza will make its way into the interior of Mexico from these various points, but mainly from this port. So how does that look like on the ground? So just, I keep repeating the background of a very recent revolution. People have moved because they've been scared to the main cities, the larger urban spaces in Mexico. What this means is that people are living in very precarious conditions. They're malnourished. And this is a ripe condition for an infectious disease to take place. So what you begin to have is in the main cities, such as Mexico City, Guadalajara, is an increase in the rate of mortality and in it, the initial wave in spring of 1918 is not so deadly. But in October, and as we see in other uh, countries, it's going to be soldiers who are the first to begin to die. And that's not surprising because they're living in barracks, in poor conditions, they're again not well fed, their defenses are down. So um, from the barracks, we begin to see that it's initially 
The first wave that had happened in spring, where it had been young children, now it is the healthy, the young who are the ones who are dying. And how does Mexico deal with this? Well, it's at a loss, because there are still political tensions. The fact that a port authority, the health inspector, had been unable to communicate with Mexico City to get a clear idea of should the entire ship be quarantined? Should only certain people be quarantined? What does this mean? So what you have initially is this lack of state backing. Okay, thank you. And the private sector steps in. Who is the private sector? You will begin to have the emergence of Catholic organizations that through the belief in charity will begin to fill in a widening gap where there are no clinics or hospitals. Churches that had been, uh, uh, masses had been banned as were uh, theaters were empty, schools were empty, but churches were open the doors and you begin to have these Catholic organizations, mainly led by elite families, um, because those who were mainly uh, getting sick initially were the laborers who were living in these poor tenement conditions. So um, I see my, my one minute is up. I just want to say that there were various um, effects of this public health that influenced public health in Mexico. Something very small but significant. Meat that used to be sold out in the open, you suddenly had the requirement for it to be behind a glass so that people could not cough or sneeze behind it. So suddenly you had these small changes. The need to pave the streets that led to the rural towns were in some ways these manifestations of a much larger epidemic in which we had tangible daily um, effects. And I, I will... Thank you so much for keeping time on me. <laughs> I'll stop there.